vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. One goal, one vision to see you exalted. We are the body of Christ. And to this we give our lives to see you glorified. One heart, one spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Please be seated. I'm excited this morning to get to take part in uh, a series that we're moving through on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, most of our connect groups, our small groups on Sunday evenings are joining us through, through the series on the Sermon on the Mount entitled Living Jesus. And I, I love that, that we get to break this up and take such a meaningful passage and, and really take it piece by piece and understand the teachings that Jesus has for us. I think it's important as we, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount that remember where we started. We, we started at the end in, in chapter 7 where Jesus tells this little nursery rhyme, nursery story about two kinds of houses that were being built. He says one was built on the rock and one was built in the sand. And we have to take all of the Sermon on the Mount with an understanding of, of the fact that Jesus the architect and creator of all things, the one who made the plan for us, has designed things in such a way and he's given us the plans. He's given us the plans to understand and he says you can either build your house on the rock where it stands firm no matter what storms are going to happen or you can build your house on the sand and you can let it all come to nothing. And I think it's important that we, we take that perspective as we dive into each of these individual lessons on the Sermon on the Mount. So before I start this morning, I, I'm going to start off with a prayer. A prayer that I hope we can be hearers and practicers, practicers of the Word of God, the words that He gave us. That we can hear these words and not just hear them because it's Sunday morning but we can take them this week and practice. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity. God, I pray that you will strengthen me to say the things that you've put on my heart. God, I thank you for, for preparing me this week. I thank you for the great process that you always bring me through before I get to preach. God, I pray this morning that as we hear your word, as we, as we take it into our hearts, God, as, we, as we, we, we discuss this lesson, God, that we don't see that as an end. We don't see the knowledge of your word as the end, God, but we see practicing it and doing it and living it as the end, God, that you've intended for us. God, I pray this morning you'll open our hearts to that so that we'll be able 
to live a life that's built on a rock. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his teachings. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I was watching the game last night, and I, was, I started to get a little scared that, that Brett has some sort of um, extra ability to know the score. You know, I was, when I heard which lesson I was going to be doing this week when he was in Rwanda, I thought, wow, enemies, that's kind of a touchy subject. In the last couple, uh, I guess up until the last couple minutes of the game last night, I was worried I was going to have a lot of angry people with lots of enemies. Um, luckily, that, that turned out okay, and I don't have to ask forgiveness from Brett for, for be, him, creating him as my enemy this morning. You know, the truth is we love rivalries, don't we? We, we, we tend to come up, the, up with them very quickly. Rivalries are a part of every story. You have to have the, the antagonist in the story, and, and, and we love our rivalries. I've got a, I've got a few examples here I want to show you um, from childhood that we come up with. Can I get y'all to go to the next slide for me? And the next one. There we go. We're going to run through these a little quick. You know, as you're a kid, it's always boys versus girls in everything. So we start from an early age with this understanding of, of boys versus girls, but, but then we even grow up into it, don't we? I, I mean, in every conversation, it's, it's got to be the stereotype of, of us versus them, it seems like. It always turns into that. Let's, let's go on a little bit. We, all, we, all, we love the battles between cats and dogs, all right? I'm sure we could, we could separate the sides here between cat lovers and dog lovers, and we could cr- create quite an issue for ourselves based on how we felt about our cats or how we felt about our dogs. And then we go on, we have all sorts of things, you know, Wiley e. Coyote and the road, Roadrunner. We, we have zombies and, and people. I know maybe not all of y'all are into that. You know, we have Apple versus Windows or Android or Samsung or pretty much everyone, right? There's, there's always something in competition. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm going there, right? Um, we like to create this competition. And sure, I, I love our democratic system, but don't we tend to make it bigger than just the democracy of having different sides? Or the things that really matter to us, our football. You know, it's not just enough to have your favorite team. You have to have the team you're against, the team you hate. You know, last night's game was big, not just because it was another football game, not just because it was, you know, it... it, it it mattered a lot, but it was big because, you know, Alabama fans don't really like LSU fans all that much, right? We tend to worry about things quite a bit because we all love all rivalries. So, so the question this morning in, then is, who is your enemy? And yeah, we can have a lot of fun and talk about silly enemies that we have, but this morning I think it's really important, and, and, and this comes back to the, the whole premise of the Sermon on the Mount, that, that, that we're to be hearers and practicers of this sermon, of what Christ is telling us to do. So I think it's important for us this morning to try to get a picture of, of who our enemies are. So I, I want to spend just a minute. Um, you can close your eyes if you need to. Wives, it's okay if your husband closes his eyes just for the next 30 seconds. After that, you can wake him back up, okay? You can close your eyes if you need to, but I want you to visualize I want you to visualize who your enemy is. Enemies can be, it can be over big things, it can be little things. You know, I think the first thing, as I'm reading this pa- passage, we, we start thinking of the, the big enemies. We, we start thinking about that, that boss, maybe, that won't give us the promotion, or the, the boss that works us too hard. Maybe we think about coworkers that don't pull their weight and always seem to get by with our efforts. Maybe it's our arch rival. Maybe it's still that high school somebody that you didn't get along with that you still can't stand. Maybe they stole a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Maybe they got your spot on a team. We tend to think of these big things that that last a long time, but I think this discussion also plays itself into a discussion of our daily enemies. The things we pick as a daily basis, whether it be that driver in front of us, whether it be that person with 12 items in the 10-item lane. We like to pick enemies. Sometimes it's our siblings. 
Sometimes it's within our family. They may not be these long-term enemies that we always hate, but, but sometimes it's the enemies, it's the battles that we choose, it's, it's these times that we pick an enemy out of someone that shouldn't be our enemy. So we all have these enemies, and I hope it's important. I hope you have in your mind, I don't want you to write their name down on your notes. I don't want you to draw a picture of them. But I hope, it's, I hope you've taken a moment and started thinking, who, who's your enemy? Who is it that you struggle to get along with? Who is it you struggle to have this Christian love we're supposed to have for? And I hope you, I hope you have a visual of that person. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. I recommend you just leave your Bibles open here this morning. I'm not going to put it on the screen, so it'll be a little bit. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to do uh, verses 38 through 48 this morning. Verse 38 starts out with, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This is known as the law of retaliation. And this one actually is found in the Old Testament. You'll find it in Exodus 21. God put this, laid this out with his followers, with the, the Israelites as they're in the desert wandering. He set this up right after the Ten Commandments. He said, yeah, I've given you the Ten Commandments, but this, this people, Israel, were a bunch of slaves. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. And they'd lived in a country of, of Egypt and they were used to different customs and different rules and different things. So God had to give them some, some, sh- some, some rules and some laws and some ways to take care of um, themselves as, as, a, as a body of people. And so he set up this law, and, and this is actually what he says. He says, you know, an, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the way that God intended it had been missed. This was set up to be for, for the law courts, for judges to make a decision in, in big matters. It, it wasn't meant as a way uh, to give us the right to retaliate. It was a way to limit the amount of the retaliation to match the crime. I mean, how often do we have this tendency to, to allow things? When somebody wrongs us, we want to one-up them, Right? I'm the youth minister, so when we take mission trips, um, we, it never fails. The prank wars begin. Many of you have been a part of it at some point in your life. Um, we, we go, we're staying in some church or some other building, and you know the girls are on one side, the boys are on one side. And the prank wars begin. At first, it's really small. You know, something just totally silly. Uh, somebody gets locked out of the building. Uh, for a few minutes, somebody gets, you know, uh, something, you know, something taken for just a minute just to tease them. And then it's always really interesting to see the cycle of retaliation that comes up. Because one will do something small, and then it gets a little bit bigger the next time, and a little bit bigger the next time, a little bit bigger the next time. And before, it doesn't take long, before whatever this process is happening... It's gotten so big and out of control that I have to call stop on it and I have to get mean and say, guys, we can't do this anymore because y'all are out of hand. And it's not because they're bad. It's not because they want to hurt each other or actually you know, do the things that they're thinking of. It's just we have this, in, this desire to one-up the person that's wronged us. And I think that happens not just in, on youth group trips, but I think that happens in our life. If that person cuts you off, the desire is to get them back somehow. I mean, isn't that the way, reason that our world has, has gone so wrong, that we have this idea of rights and that, that justice is, is for me to get them back? And just, just like us, the, the, the Jews in this day, in Jesus' day, had taken this wrong and said, you know what, it's our right to get people back. It's our eye. It, it's our right to take an eye if an eye's been taken. It's not the way that God intended it. So we, we look at what Jesus has to, in response to this. He's not getting rid of this law, but he's going to take it a step better. Jesus is going to show them that they've missed the original intent. 
So we look at verse 39. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Now that's the NIV translation. One time I'm not a big fan of the NIV translation. He says, do not resist an evil person. But God says all throughout Scripture that we're, we're to resist evil, that the evil things in this world are not supposed to be what we're about. And so I think this translation is, is a difficult one. If you take the, the words literally, and I didn't do this, but if you take the words and, and you actually translate word for word, it actually says, don't retaliate vengefully by doing evil. Don't retaliate vengefully by doing evil. We should resist evil, but Je- what Jesus is saying here is, is don't take revenge on someone who wrongs you. It, it echoes in my ears the words of Romans 12, where Paul says, don't repay evil for evil. Proverbs 19 says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Jesus is talking about this vicious cycle that happens when somebody wrongs us. He's talking about this cycle that happens that we've got to one-up each other, and this, it just gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it's bigger. And he says, don't retaliate. Don't, don't add evil to evil. Two wrongs don't make a right. He tells us to stop the vicious cycle of vengeance. And I know some days it seems like no big deal. You know, when it's pranks on a youth trip, when it's, when it's funny little things, we, we don't worry about it. But isn't that the way it works when you've got a coworker? It just, I mean, seems to get you every time. Or when that neighbor is just continuing to be loud and obnoxious or, or doesn't, you know, keep their yard right or their dog's too loud or whatever's happening. Or maybe they park the cars in the way or whatever, whatever else it is. Maybe it's that person in line that we want, we want to, you know, they've got too many items in the 10-item lane and we're in a hurry and our first intention, our first thought so often is to want to get back at them and, and create this cycle of vengeance. But Jesus says, no, we've got to stop that. Now, one, one thing that I have to be careful of, and I want to make, make a quick point this morning. If you look at the original way that the NIV says that, which you know, most of us have this in our Bible, it says, do not resist an evil person. I, I've known people that have used this for the wrong way. And so if you're, if you're here this morning and, and you're in a relationship, you're, maybe you're a child, um, a husband or wife, or um, any sort of relationship where there's abuse, maybe there's physical, emotional, or sexual abuse in any sort of relationship, this is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus doesn't say, don't resist that person. Jesus is not okay with abuse on that level, and he doesn't tell us to sit back into it. So let's look at a couple ways that Jesus is talking about. Next, Jesus gives us three examples. He said, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So first we have a slap on the cheek. And really in, in Bible times, this was uh, less about the physical damage that, that a slap on the cheek would cause and more about the insult. This was, this was a, a matter of honor and pride. If somebody slapped you on the cheek, they didn't think you worthy. And so the example that Jesus gives us here is if somebody insults you. Do you have somebody that's insulted you? Somebody maybe that's damaged your pride or said you couldn't do something. Somebody in your life, maybe, um, maybe it's that coworker, maybe it's, maybe it's someone in your family who's insulted you, who's told you, you know what, I don't think you're worthy. That's who Jesus is talking to. The next one is, is the person that is, is taking you to court and suing you for your shirt. And this is an, this is an interesting one because... Um, we, we kind of have to get, again, back into the context. The garments in this day was, was basically an undershirt um, and then your cloak. 
Now, Old Testament law prohibited you to sue someone for their, their outer coat, their garment. It was, it was against the law in Jewish times to sue someone for the coat because um, it said, you know, what they, what, that was their blanket when they covered up at night. That was, that was the way they kept warm. And so what, what the, the illustration here that Jesus is telling us is, this isn't just about somebody who, you know, you owe a little money to and, and they're going to get it back from you. This is someone who's taking you for everything you're worth. This is somebody who demands too much of you because they couldn't get your jacket, but they could sue you for your undergarments. So do, don't we all have people that demand too much of us? Again, you know, this one lends itself to the boss or the coworker that make us do the work or make you keep too long hours. Maybe sometimes it's your spouse or your kids or your mom or dad that demands too much of you. That's who Jesus is talking about today. And then the last one is, is really specifically to the time. Um, during this time, the, the, Roman, the Romans that occupied the land could demand for a Jew for anyone um, that was a citizen there to walk with them and carry their bags for a mile. That was the limit they could carry it one mile, but they had, to, they had to obey. Now, we don't have people that, you know, walking down the street say, hey, carry my bag, and, and you have to do it for a mile. It's not quite the same situation. But the point was, this was an unfair treatment of the Jews. This was an unfair treatment of, of people and don't we have a similar system here where if people can demand something of you, if they can treat you unfairly, it's going to happen. And again, this, this goes for the big things. This goes for that, you know, that, that job at work, that guy that does the same job and makes a little more. Maybe it's that person that, that thinks they're you know, in a bigger hurry than you or whatever, so they cut in line or, or they get in front of you. But there's people around us that treat us unfairly, and this is the kind of people that Jesus is talking about. But I want you to look down at the verse. I want you to look at the words that Jesus says for us. In these situations, he says, turn to him. He says, let him, let him have also your cloak. He says, go with him more. Jesus didn't say, you know, make it fair. He doesn't say you have a right and you're being abused. All these terms are, are, are relational terms. It says it's not about us. It's about that other person. And that's hard when they're enemies. I love the way the message translated. It says, live generously. In each of these situ situations, when someone insults you, when someone demands too much, when somebody is, is unfairly treating you, do we know how to live generously? To live so that whatever we do, our every response to, to our enemies, to the things that happen wrong in our lives, that we're seen as generous? Glenn Stassen said it this way, Jesus is calling us to surprising initiatives, to creative and preventative measures that can break up the hatred and distrust and move on to justice. Jesus gave us three examples there, and then he comes on, I, I think, the same subject. I don't think Jesus added the love for enemies title between these, because I think it's the same conversation. He says, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, you can search all day. You're not going to find an exact quote for that. The love your neighbor is obviously in there, but the hate your neighbor isn't. But it was, during this day, an, an acceptable ethical practice. You know, it's, it's normal for them to say, you know what, if, if, the, if somebody's treating you right, you can love them. They're your neighbor. But if they're not, you know, Lord help them, right? And I, I think we have the same practice today. It's so easy to be nice to the people that are around us that, that treat us well. You know, we, we, we know the story where God starts defining who our neighbors are. And I think this plays into that discussion that that Jesus says our job is to love everybody. Love is for everyone. It's not just for some special chosen people, not just to the people that are nice to us, but it's for everybody. See, we take what, what is you versus them, 
And we, and we tend to vilify everyone, don't we? And, and turn it into you versus them. We tend to make it, you know, we're always in the right. We did everything right. We just, you know, we just don't understand what happened in the situation, that it went so wrong. And we just totally vilify them. It doesn't matter who it is. If you're ever vilified like your, your, your friend, someone who's a close friend, maybe it's a sibling, who you love, you live with every day, and, and all of a sudden, instead of them making a mistake, you know, they, they, are, they are evil because they stole the last cookie. You know, it, it's, it's that sort of um, exaggeration that we put on things when someone becomes our enemy, when they become our villain, we start to visualize them, I think, almost with, with horns and a tail because we've got to be right. And that makes them very wrong. And we draw this line and we cause a separation and we see everything is, is us versus them. You know, if you're driving down the road, the person that cuts you off isn't, isn't just a little distracted they're not just a little uh, maybe thinking about something else. They don't care about anybody. They, they just have a death wish. It's not the way it should be. So Jesus turns this idea around on them. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love is for everyone. And he says it is, it's not just a putting up with them. He doesn't say, you know what, um, just ignore it. Don't worry about it. Try to avoid that person. He says it's bigger than that. He says our job as Christians is to love our enemies and pray for them. I, I don't know about you, but I've had a hard time praying for somebody that I hate. I, maybe you've, you've come to a similar situation. I, you know, I, there's, a, there's not very many people that I've even tried to hate in my life, but it's happened. And you start to pray to God and you just don't feel right about it. And I can be sitting there venting to somebody. I can be complaining left and right about all the things that are going on. But if I start to pray and I start to follow this as just some legalistic, hey, i got to pr- say a prayer for them, it makes it tough. Because prayer is, is our connection with God that opens our heart up to Him. And when I start to pray... I feel kind of open and bare to God. And he seeps in and changes that hate to something different. Not just a, yeah, whatever, I'll avoid them, but something big. And I think we have to be careful because this doesn't mean we make a prayer request out of them, which we tend to do sometimes. This doesn't mean we bring it up at our next, you know, support group meeting and say, you know, I I think we need to pray for so-and-so who's doing this and this and this and this. That's not what he's talking about. He says, you pray for them. What he's really saying in this passage, and and again, the message translates it, that your enemies should bring out your best. Shouldn't they? This isn't what the world tells us to do. But Jesus is saying... Your enemies, those people that that are difficult to love, they should bring out your best. That's what the prayer is for. If a holy and completely perfect God can look down on everyone on this world, the righteous, the unrighteous, the holy, the unholy, everyone, and he can love them. He can send the rain, like it says in 46 and 7. He can send the rain. He He can provide and take care of the righteous and the unrighteous. He loves us all the same then can't we, who aren't holy and perfect, can't we see beyond that? And then he jumps to verse 48. And again, I I think we have some some interesting translation here. Because the Sermon on the Mount is is not about perfection. We, we, We said that this is something that we can live up to. We can attain what Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount. That, that we can work towards all these things, and, and not towards perfection, but towards a lifestyle, towards an, an active seeking of God in that relationship. So what he's, the, the word he uses here that, that is translated perfect in our NIV can, can actually better be pr- probably translated as wholeness 
or completeness. That God, in this situation with our enemies, doesn't, doesn't expect us to, to be perfect all the time, but he expects us to understand his complete love. That 46 and 40, verses 46 and verse 7 say that we should, that because God can send the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, the holy and the unholy, that's perfect love. That's complete love. Not just loving the people that love us, but complete love loves our enemies as well. And so verse 48, and the message translates it, grow up. And, and this isn't, I don't think this is the derogatory, just grow up. I think this is the growing up into that completeness, into that perfection that God calls us to. I think is this, this is that understanding of, of the bigger picture of what love is about, of what our role here is. That we grow up into this completion of what God wants us to be. You know, growing up is, is a lot about learning it's not about us. It's about seeing the situation of, of us versus our enemies and saying, you know what? This situation, I'm not the only one involved. God has a bigger picture. He has a bigger plan. And how can God use me in this situation to show love? It's about loving them. You know, we could go back through our examples of the driver of, of someone who cuts us off in line, somebody who um, says wrong things about us, somebody says that gets, you know, what we deserve. What it's really about is us loving them. It's about us showing God's love in a true and complete and perfect way to everyone and understanding that love is not just for our favorite people, not just to those who are nice to us because everybody can do that. But God's love is for everyone. That doesn't mean we, get, we always get along. doesn't mean we agree and say, yeah, you're right, never mind about what I thought. But it says we get along, we show love. This doesn't make Jesus a pushover. This doesn't make Jesus a softy that just takes everything. But what Jesus is telling us is to actively seek, to creatively seek that restoration, to, to find justice in that relationship, and to show love. So we've really got a choice here, and, and, and I think it's, this ties perfectly with the bigger theme that is the Sermon on the Mount. It is you versus them is a small choice. It's one of the micro decisions that we have to make in the Sermon on the Mount. The real choice is are we going to choose to live on the rock or are we going to choose to live on the sand? It's easy I think when, by the time we get to the story, this parable that he tells about living on rock or living on the sand. Because in that story by itself, we, we tend to say, you know what? Rock's solid. It's pretty easy. I don't want to build a house on the sand. And I think we lose track of all the things that he's taught us up until that point. But I think once we make this decision, once we make a decision, you, you know what? I trust God. That's where I'm going to build my faith. That's where my hope stands, is in the rock. And what Jesus teaches is truth. And it's possible for me to live that today. I think when we make that decision of living on the rock, it includes a decision about loving others. And so as we go out this week, maybe you've got an opportunity to show love to an enemy. Maybe it's in a big picture. Maybe it's somebody that you've had some feud with that has just grown into this vicious cycle and you're ready to stop it. Maybe it's, maybe it's more of the daily decision that you have to make to not be on edge and not to allow every little thing that happens between you and your spouse or your kids or the person at the store turn into a vicious cycle. But to actively seek to show them the love of God. Because what Jesus is really teaching us in this is to live on the rock. He's teaching us that life on the rock is better. Life on the rock is the way he intended things to be. And I hope we can walk out of here this week with an understanding of how to live on the rock when our enemies come. If you've got something we need to pray about this morning, 
Maybe something uh, this morning, maybe you've got an enemy that you need to, you need, you need prayer so that you can make sure that you are the love and, and, and the example, the salt and light that Jesus calls you to be in that relationship. Maybe you're just hurting. Maybe this, it's not about this lesson this morning. Maybe it's just something that's on your heart that you need prayers over. Maybe this morning you'd like to decide to give your life to Christ, to decide, you know what, my faith has been in something that just is, is fading away like the sand, but this morning I want to I put my life on a rock. I hope this morning you should take an opportunity. I'm gonna, we'll be down front. We'll have some of our shepherds down front. If it's something more private, you'd be more comfortable back here in, in uh, the 113. I believe it's 113 still. Uh, we're going to have some shepherds uh, there ready for you to pray with. I hope this morning, as you're trying to decide this, am I living on the rock or am I living on the sand, I hope this morning you come and ask for prayers as we stand and sing. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love, love. Lovely Bailey and her family came forward this morning. Just, um, I think like we all say, life's tough sometimes. And we need prayers. And I want, I want everyone to know that this place is a place that believes in prayer. So maybe, maybe you hadn't had a chance to come down this morning. Maybe it felt a little awkward to you. But there are still leaders in this place. There are still people that want to pray for you and reach out. Because get, we have a God that, that answers prayers. And we have God that gives us strength when we need it. Life isn't easy. He doesn't promise that. But he promises to be here and with us. And so I, I thank Bailey for, or lovely for her strength to come down this morning. And I, and I pray that we will have the strength to trust in God this week. So I'm going to turn back over to you. You got one more? Okay, go ahead. 
Let's stand together and sing. Blessed Jesus, come to me. Soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Glorious, marvelous grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Holy, worthy, holy, worthy, holy, worthy, holy, worthy, holy, worthy is the Lamb who died. 